to Romans chapter 7. We're going to read verse 1 again. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. We're going to go down to verse 6. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. And so what we're seeing again is that, that metaphor talking about comparing marriage to the law and to Christ, and, and showing basically a, a transition for the believer on Jesus Christ to go from being under the, the government, if you will, of the law of the old covenant and going now into the new covenant and being under that new covenant through Jesus Christ. And that happens because of, again, the crucifixion of the old man our sin nature with Christ when he died on the cross. We saw that in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. And so now we're, we're no longer, when a person has become born again, when they have repented of their sins and believed on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are no longer under the dominion of the law. They are now under the dominion of grace. And grace always does expect more from the believer than the law ever did. And so essentially with the law, that's referring to our old creation. That's referring to the old man. And, and in a way that, that marriage, if you will, to, to Adam, the first Adam, and oh, being under the law and under God's, really sadly also God's wrath and everything else because the law does not save anybody. All the law does is point us to Jesus Christ. But we cannot be saved by keeping the law. And that's why, again, why I say the law actually expects more from the believer. No, I'm sorry. Grace expects more from the believer than does the law. I, I was blessed this week. I was able to talk with somebody at work about this briefly. And pointed out that the law is a is in a lot of ways a list of do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Whereas grace takes that same list but turns it up a notch, if you will, a little bit further and says, okay, if you, it says, the Bible says for the law, don't kill. However, Jesus Christ says, and takes it a step further. He says, if you hate somebody in your heart, you've essentially killed them. So you've still broken the law. Even though you may not have physically killed somebody, you have still essentially broken God's law by hating them so that you've, in a sense, killed them. And so grace expects even that much more from us. It expects more responsibility from us. It expects us to think more. It's not just keeping a list. And that's where the Pharisees and the scribes and all of that, that's where they went off course because they turned the law into being that do and don't list and, and sticking to the letter of the law rather than the spirit of why that law was in place. You know, and so not being able to say, well, I'm in good shape today because I didn't kill anybody. Okay, that's great. But that's not what made you in good shape. Jesus Christ is what makes you righteous and holy, not my own actions or my own inactions either way. 
And so we are now in the new creation when we are born again. And that's why he talks about being born again. We are now, in a sense, married to Jesus Christ. And Christ is that head of the new regenerated believer. And Paul shows that same idea in Galatians chapter 4 to, to show the, the dispensational transference from being under the law to under grace. So keep your finger still in Romans chapter 7, but go over to Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Galatians 4, verse 1. And Paul writes, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now drop down to verse 21. Paul continues, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one came from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children, than she which hath an husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And so what we're showing here in, in Galatians chapter 4 is the, the, the negative light in a way of what the law ends up saying here. You know, what was happening was that the, the, Jew, the Jews were taking God's law and they were misapplying it. They weren't using it the way that it was meant. You know, because again, the law was meant to show that you can't be saved by the law. But what did they end up doing instead? They took the law and tried to make it into the means for salvation. And so that's why there was such the focus on keeping the letter of the law. I need to do exactly this. You know, how the Pharisees would have their, their, their tassels be extra long because... You know, the two inches that were described in the Bible wasn't enough. I need to be extra holy, if you will. I need to make myself be extra holy by my own efforts and have extra long tassels so everybody can see how holy I am. You know, the, the, with the 
when Jesus Christ talks about the Pharisee and the publican and how the, the Pharisee spends his time comparing himself to what the publican. And I, I thank God I'm not as that man. I fast twice a week and I tithe and I do this and I do this and I do this. That's where they had taken the law to, trying to do everything of the law. We can't keep the law. And that's what the whole idea was, is that they would see, we can't do it. But they would pick and choose. And that's why, again, James says, if you break one aspect of the law, it is as if you broke the whole law. You know, you, you look, think about a, a, a windshield of a car for a moment. When, when you have a, a windshield, you know, if you just break a little bit of the windshield, you can't repair that. And you think about it, it's made with safety glass, which means it's got stuff in there. So if you have something big hit that windshield, what ends up happening? You don't have just this little break in it. It shatters all the way across the windshield. It'll still hold together most times, but the whole thing is no longer of any use. It's the same idea with the law. You may have a small rock come up and hit the windshield and put at first a small crack into it, but what ends up happening over time, that crack will grow. And you can't just cut out a little hole and plug in a new piece of glass to fix it. And it's the same idea with the law. If we break one part of the law, we've broken the whole law, and we will be judged based on that. But that's what they tried to do. They were basically doing legalism by trying to keep the law and going beyond what the law said and even more so beyond what the intent of what the law was trying to say. The law does not bring any salvation to a soul. And, and, and really, it's a hopeless marriage. It will not produce any fruit. And that's what Paul is now talking about when he starts talking about Hagar versus Sarah in Galatians chapter 4 there. You know, they, they went beyond what God had wanted them to do. God had promised Abraham a son. Abraham was promised a son. His son was Isaac. That was the son of promise. They couldn't wait. So what did they do? They took the handmaid from Egypt, Hagar, and had Abraham go in, and that produced Ishmael. And it was misery ever since then. Why? Because it was essentially a marriage, quotation marks around marriage, it was something put together that was never meant to be put together. They thought they could help God along in the process they, they thought they needed to do something more. It doesn't work that way. Salvation is all of God and not of myself. And so there in verses, chapter Galatians 4, verses 21 to 31, Paul calls it an allegory and points out to that false hope of salvation that's found in the law. You can't do that. Now, he talks about marriage in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. And again, it's a case of a false hope of trying to have God's righteousness by following a false marriage in there. And it talks about how, um, again, the, the teaching about marriage in Galatians, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 6 there are those that will try to say, but this isn't what marriage is being taught about. And yes, you have to take everything that's being taught in the Bible here um, and not just focus in the one part, but it makes it... There are those that will say that the teaching about marriage in Romans chapter 7 is not a true teaching about marriage. Well, it doesn't make any sense that... that you can't say all, all you learn about marriage is found in either in the Gospels or in 1 Corinthians, but we have to leave out Romans 7. That makes no sense. But there are those that will believe that. Instead, 
it's incorporated in there. Why would Paul work on showing a doctrine by using something that was false? It would be like me trying to teach holiness by using a fictional character. You know, why do that if I can show Jesus Christ instead? That, that just, it doesn't make sense to try to make that type of application or to try and say something like that. So Paul is using the historical account of the birth of Abraham and, I'm sorry, the birth of Isaac and Ishmael to show the difference between grace and the law. And, and so he uses the, the example of Hagar, you know, spelled Agar, A-G-A-R in here, for this, a, verse 25, for example, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So Hagar is pointing towards the law. That's what Hagar was, was a type of the law, points towards the law. Because what had happened? Abraham tried to take matters into his own hands to achieve what God had already said would happen. And in, with Sarah, she was the one that was promised to be the one to bear the child. And that's the grace of God in there. Because again, Hagar was of an age to bear a child. Sarah was not of an age to bear a child. She was well beyond normal childbearing years, which again, only she was only able to have that child because of God, not because of any efforts on her own, not because of any efforts on Abraham's part, only because God was able to provide that. And that's grace. Grace is all of God and none of me. Hagar was a bond slave, and that's what the law is to us. The law is that puts us into bondage. The law is what keeps us there, and, and it's only by God's grace that we are set free from the bondage of the law. Uh, verse 23, But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was was by promise. So he who was of the bondwoman, that would be, of course, again, Ishmael. That's the way of the flesh, whereas Sarah represents the way of the promise of God. And, and so, again, we see that the, <coughs> the covenant that was represented by Ishmael being coming from Hagar is that Sinai covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the law that was given unto Moses, whereas the covenant represented by Isaac, the offspring of Sarah, is the Abrahamic covenant, which leads towards the new covenant. What was the Abrahamic covenant? Again, we've talked about this in the past. The Abrahamic covenant was that Abraham was going to have a great nation come forth from him, and it was going to come forth through that child of promise, not through the child of the works that Abraham did through Hagar. And, and so we have that promise, and so we are part of that, that promise. We saw that when we went through Galatians chapter 3 back in 2017. And so what do we see as we go through Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 6? A marriage to the law is not going to produce good fruit. A marriage to the law is only going to keep a person in bondage and stay in bondage. The only way that that marriage can then be broken up is through death. The law doesn't die, however, and, and that's an important distinction there. The law doesn't die. If you keep your finger still in Galatians, but go back over to Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. You know, and so again, and we talked about this some last week as well, we, we, the law did not die. The law is still there. But we're freed from the law by the death of Jesus Christ. And because he died first, when 
we believe on him, we believe his gospel, repent of our sins, we essentially died with him on the cross as well. Again, it goes back to Romans chapter 6, what we just talked about. <coughs> we essentially died with him on the cross, and so we are no longer under the law. We're no longer married to the law because a death has happened. Ours. And now we are married to Christ, as it continues there in verse 4, that ye should be married to another. Who is that another? Jesus Christ, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Being under the law does not bring forth fruit unto God. All the law does is bring forth fruit that doesn't produce really anything. That's why they had to go and they had to bring the sacrifices and the animals sacri were sacrificed to, to atone for the sins and, and so forth, but they didn't bring forth any real fruit unto God. God doesn't need a dead bull. He commanded this as that sacrifice is being made unto him. But he didn't need those things. And so what ends up happening is our sin nature Bound, bound, binds us to the law, Christ accomplished our release from that because he died on the cross and thus fulfilled the law, which he did. He never broke any aspect of the law during his time here on earth. And with his death, our sin nature was essentially crucified with Jesus Christ. And this is a work of God's grace and it moved us from being under the law to now being under grace, which is now that much more. And, and so it is really even more so a joining of us to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ indwells us, just as God indwells us. Know ye not that, you're not that you are the temple of God? And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we have God indwelling us, something completely different from what had ever been taught by any of the pagan mythologies out there. God now indwells us when we believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ and repent of our sins. We have that, and so we are joined together with him. And so real spiritual fruit which is God's righteousness, is the potential of our marriage to Jesus Christ. And that's what we're to do, is to bear fruit. We're to give fruit out there. We're, we're, you're still in Romans. Go up to verse chapter 6, verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. And again, it, Romans is one of those books where we would be better off without chapter numbers. It would just work out so much easier because, again, we always end up drawing a dividing line, putting up a wall. Chapter 6 is done. Now chapter 7 begins. But they don't. They tie in together. And so everything that Paul said in 6 leads right into 7. Really, everything that Paul said from chapter 1 they all flow together to get us to chapter 7 here. And so what ends up happening when we, when we become free from being made free from sin, not just set free from sin, but made free from sin, we become servants of God and we have our fruit unto holiness. That means that's fruit that is going to be pleasing and honoring to God and not toward ourselves. It's going to be for him and not for ourselves. And it means that we will grow in holiness. We will grow looking to follow him and serve him. And so we are now no longer just fleshly bodies going about our days here on earth, but our spirit has been quickened, it's been made alive, and we're to live in obedience to him. And what ends up happening, I need to then decrease so that Jesus Christ will increase. So it becomes less and less about me and more and more about God. 
and that's the direction that we're to go as we're walking. Romans chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. We were, in other words, this is before we were saved and regenerated. We are going through the daily motions of living a life that, that <coughs> really wanted nothing to do with God. We may have said the right types of things and dressed the right types of way and, and even attended churches or whatever else, but we were not truly following God. We were just going through the motions. It was not a true marriage, if you will. The true marriage is going to have two become one. They're going to cleave together and be one together towards Jesus Christ. We all begin our lives essentially spiritually dead, and, and, and then we are moving towards that physical death and ultimately towards a second death if we never become born again. And, and sadly, Sin always will bring us downward. There is always that degrading that happens with sin. What do I mean by degrading? In other words, we continue to break down. If you took a, a piece of bread and you buried it in the ground, what ends up happening to that bread? It's going to eventually break down. If you were to put it in the ground and then dig it up in a month, you'd still find some remnants of the bread and the crust and everything, and then you put it back in the ground again and uncovered it in, in another month, there'd be even less bread there. Why? Because it slowly continues to break down, just as our bodies are slowly breaking down as we get older. Our cells don't replace themselves. Our hairs don't replace themselves. We, we groan and ache and pain as we get older and older. Why? Because there is that slow degradation that ends up happening because we're in corruptible bodies. Verse 6, but now, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we have been delivered from the bondage of sin because we were again made free not just set free, we were declared free by God because we believed on his son, Jesus Christ, repented of our sins, and so we were now delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. And so we're now going to walk in that new spirit. There should be something different about us than when we were a lost person than when we were before when we were under the old birth before we became born again if there's not a difference then there's a problem something didn't happen but so often that's what ends up happening is a person makes a declaration of faith but there's been no change in their lives does everybody change at the same pace no but there should be something along the way. Otherwise, they're really just still heading on the wrong path. They're still married to the law. They're still under the bondage of the law. Just because they make a, 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 give themselves a title, make a declaration about themselves, did not make them born again. They need to actually have believed and and repented of their sin. So there needs to be that more there. Now, we have been crucified with Christ, again, back in Romans 6, 6. Every believer is then given the freedom of choice to serve the law, to serve the Lord. We can serve the Lord. Now, we have a choice. We can still end up trying to live our lives under the law, or we can try and serve, ser live our lives under God's grace. And so many will end up trying to stay under the law. And that's what Paul kept seeing in the book of Acts. 
how the Judaizers would come in and say, oh, you need to be circumcised, you need to, to have follow the dietary laws, those 